So today we have Eric Hardy in Yatasba, uh, Largo Anderson with Indigenous Library and Chip Cultural Resilience at the Labriola Center. So welcome and go ahead. Hello. Um, just really quickly, are we? Do we share screen now? Yes, yeah. you can share your screen now. Okay, that's mm -hmm. gonna kick you guys off. <laughs> cool. I think you guys can see our screen. So, um, yeah. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are currently at ASU and we are currently on Autumn and Peeposh territory. As indigenous peoples, you know, I want to make sure that we are acknowledging the lands and who uh, the peoples of whose lands we're on, because um, it's important, especially when it comes to you know what we talk about in terms of cultural resiliency. Um, with that said, you know we're, we're excited to present to everyone here from the uh, AZL folks. You know, uh, we're really happy to share what we've learned as a indigenous library located within ASU's library system, and the ways in which we've been kind of leveraging what we call cultural resiliency in this space. Um, I'll get into kind of what we talk about in terms of cultural resiliency because, you know, I uh, want to be clear on some definitions. So we'll get to that here in a little bit, and hopefully that will help you guys understand what we're doing. Um, so to begin, uh, my name is, uh, I'll introduce myself and I'll let uh, my, my uh, other co-worker here introduce herself. So, Danenda Shlin, Twitch Eatney and Shlin, Kluge Bushes Chin, Touch Eatney, the Shisha Topa and Shinala, Nakabitua Yasina Shasha Air Cardi and Shia. Uh, so for those that don't speak Navajo, my name is Eric Hardy, and I am the Senior Program Coordinator here at the Labriola National American Indian Data Center. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to my, my co-worker here to share where, where she's from. Yes, Hello, uh, my name is Yatazba, um, I'm Navajo. Um, and I'm the program coordinator here at Labriola, um, mostly based at West Campus, but I do come out to Tempe to assist with events. Cool. So we'll get right into it. So today we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the who and what is the Labriola National American Indian Data Center, but also the, how we, we use what we call Indigenous librarianship. Um, and what does that mean and what does that look like? So I'll go ahead and turn it over to Tazba, and she can kind of go through some of the overview and learning objectives. Uh, yeah, so we'll talk about um, Indigenous libraries, specifically um, how uh, the Labriola Center works within ASU libraries. Um, we'll also talk about what cultural resilience is, uh, give a definition of that. Um, and then utilizing the library for cultural resilience, like how we're doing that with programming and our collections. So by the end of the presentation, you'll be able to identify what an indigenous library is, understand colonization, historical trauma, and cultural resilience, see how the Labriola engages with cultural resilience and our library. And uh, understand colonization, historical trauma, and cultural resilience. For me, those are things that all shape what we're going to talk about in terms of cultural resiliency. Uh, many times folks uh, will talk specifically just about culture resiliency, but for me, I like to kind of talk about the steps to culture resiliency, if that makes sense. And hopefully that uh, help you understand why what we're doing here is important. I also want to kind of preface this to say that, you know, we're a indigenous library within ASU's library system. So there's a certain positionality that we have and certain things that come with that. I will say that, you know, if you are working outside of ASU and you're working, you know, in um, the public sector, so to speak, um, within your libraries and you want to work with other libraries, indigenous libraries, you know, there are folks and tribal libraries and, you know, tribal communities that have their own libraries that you can reach out to in addition to who, to us. Um, so I want to make that kind of clear as we're moving forward. So, you know, indigenous libraries equal cultural resiliency, you know, what does that all mean? How, why is this important or what, how are we defining these things? You know, for us as indigenous people, it's libraries in a lot of ways um, look a certain way. And, you know, that comes from just the way in which libraries are perceived as. And so what I'm going to ask you all to think about is like, what do you think about when you think of a library? 
um, like who's in the library, what's in the library, what, what does the library do? Um, a lot of times when we ask the audience if we were in person, you know, we would have a back and forth on this conversation. But a lot of times when we ask that question, especially when it comes to indigenous peoples and, you know, indigenous students here at ASU, a lot of times this is what they tell us. Um, usually there's a librarian that has some sort of authority, right? Whether it's authority in terms of having the ability to oversee knowledge or be a knowledge keeper, but sometimes it's to maintain, you know, quote unquote, the the quietness in a library, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying like all libraries are like this, but this is the mentality that a lot of folks kind of see libraries as. Um, in addition to that, you know, libraries are also an institution. A lot of uh, folks see them as an institution, especially for, you know, tribal communities. Tribal communities, we have libraries in them, but sometimes the perception is that libraries are a Western institution. They're not so much an indigenous institution. Although we do have them in our communities, there's still a lot of um, uh, understanding that needs to kind of be understood for us to kind of really engage with a library that makes sense for Indigenous peoples. In addition to all of that, you know, libraries in themselves also have a certain look, and I'll let Tasma talk a little bit about that. Yeah, Um. so historically, like, a lot of libraries are in, like, very large spaces, uh, very grandiose, um, and almost, like, church-like. Um, my library at my undergrad was a lot like this, um, and like even the carousels, that word I learned comes from um, like being in a church and studying at a desk. So personally, that was my relationship with the library is it's kind of like a sacred space and that librarians have that authority of knowing all, like having that knowledge and there was kind of like a disconnect. Yeah, and there's a no, uh, you thought we mentioned sacredness. Um, I think there's different ways in which we can understand that word. For us, indigenous peoples, we understand sacredness from a very different kind of standpoint. Whereas sacredness, in some ways, could be saying it's very rigid, it's very attached to Catholicism, religion, and things. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying that's a different way of looking at way in which sacredness could look. Sacredness of texts and things of that nature. Basically, whose information or knowledge systems are, you know, valued within uh, institutions such as a library and who is the knowledge systems aren't as valued as others. So that's kind of what we're getting as we're saying, you know, general librarianship has does great stuff, but there's places where, you know, the uh, some values of other knowledge systems may not be treated just as well as other knowledges. And, you know, for us as Indigenous peoples, um, when we talk about knowledge, it comes in, a, in different ways. You know, for a lot of folks, think of knowledge from a Western institution that's coming from like authority, right? There's a professor, there's a librarian, um, someone that has some sort of credentials. And then there's also what kind of knowledge? Is knowledge simply in books or is it simply in reports? You know, is it coming from a scientific methodology? Is it being in a journal? Is it peer reviewed? Uh, for us as Indigenous peoples, um, all of those things are still considered knowledge, but, you know, for us as Indigenous peoples, you know, it's also about our languages, it's also about our histories, it's also about where is that knowledge coming from, is it coming from, you know, from the land, you know, for us as Indigenous peoples, a lot of our information and knowledge literally comes from the land, it's coming from, you know, also like ceremonial practices, it's coming from, you know, traditional practices, it's coming from, you know, uh, art, it's coming from, you know, designs, it's coming from the songs that we sing, you know, all those things are considered, you know, art, or no, sorry, knowledge. And, you know, for us, it's a bit of a challenge when we come to a library, and we don't see those things here in these spaces. In addition to that, you know, uh, there's not a lot of actual Indigenous peoples in libraries. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, uh, there's not a lot of us, I guess you could say, uh, uh, brown uh, people, indigenous people specifically in libraries that understand a lot of the history of um, who we are in, you know, history within America and all these things. But also, you know, it doesn't understand. There's a lot of folks that don't know how we understand our cultural identities. We don't. Uh, there's not a lot of understanding of what cultural survival looks like. There's not a lot of understanding of what are cultural values that are still here. And, you know, more importantly, how are, are we understanding things like historical trauma and the work that we do in, in libraries? So, you know, for us as uh, la the Labriola Center, we want to be mindful of these things. Like, how are we using our library that, you know, 
Indigenous students and also individuals, non-Indigenous people can come to us to learn about these things that I'm talking about. And that's kind of why we talk about cultural resiliency, because cultural resiliency in a lot of ways is, you know, for Indigenous peoples, you know, it's a resiliency. We're, bou we're bouncing back from a lot of, you know, hardships. That's the resiliency part, and we're using our cultural knowledge to do that. Um, but, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about like how we define that cultural resiliency and, you know, what that means to us and how we engage with that the labriola. So I'm going to try to be mindful of my time here. So I'm not going through this too quick. So, you know, one of the things that we, I, I mentioned earlier is like resiliency is something that we talk about in terms of like we're coming back from or we're, we're, we're healing from something. And that's something for us as indigenous peoples is, you know, colonization. And, you know, I'm not here to talk about colonization in the sense of, you know, pointing fingers at people and say, you know, so-and-so is to blame for all the issues in our community. I want to make that very clear and say that the reason why I talk about colonization, the reason why we talk about colonization is so we understand um, how and, and what shape, how it shapes Indigenous life and experiences and, and, and overall, but more specifically, you know, for us as, you know, people that are in the library, um, so I talk about colonization as a process. It's a process that has created a relationship. Um, and, you know, colonization in a lot of ways is about uh, land. It's about getting land so you can build a colony so then colonization can happen. And as I said earlier, a lot of our knowledge and a lot of our ceremonial life or traditional life is based on land. So when those that land is taken away, then, you know, our our indigenous peoples, our livelihood starts to fall apart. And that creates a conversation between us and the colonizer, meaning that, you know, there's the colonizer that, on one side, and then there's the colonizer on the other. And that's what the relationship is built on. Um, and it's, a, and I want to say this is that colonization is a different, there's different ways to create that relationship. You know, historically there's, you know, wars, assimilation, reservations, all those things. And that all informs the relationship that we have. And it creates that relationship and it, it's a process. And I want to say that you can't have one without the other. You can't have colonization without these two these two individuals. And that's kind of what we're talking about here is we're looking at the ways in which this process shapes who we are. And here are some of the examples, you know, for us historically, what colonization has done. So it's land removal, like literally removing us off the land. Like I said earlier, if you can't have a colony without resources, and you can't get those resources unless you have land. And then there's also like boarding schools, disconnecting us, indigenous peoples, from the land through educational systems. Then there's just literally removing us off the land. You know, all of these things have played out historically and, and more importantly to it, it also delimited, 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 delegitimatizes our knowledge systems that connect us to the land. So all of this is what happens with colonization. It's a process. It's been happening for over 500 years. You know, it's something that we as indigenous peoples navigate daily. It informs our perception of every day we we, we have to navigate this um, pretty much on daily basis, especially here at the university where we have to navigate um, multiple individuals here kind of working through what they're learning and looking at history and, and us having to you know, understand history from our perspective so if colonization has happened you know like I said it's been a relationship that in a lot of ways was built on violence you know there's a other impact with that and that violence in a lot of ways creates trauma and that's when we start talking about historical trauma and i'm trying to connect historical trauma to colonization right so if colonization has been happening for 500 years it's usually violent it creates trauma and that 500 years that's the historical part and then the trauma is all the stuff that happened to us as indigenous peoples you know and <laughs> i use cartoons to kind of talk about this because it can be pretty heavy for us to talk about this um and it's the cartoon is basically a cartoon character getting punched in the face and that's been what we've been happening to us as indigenous peoples for over 500 years um we've been continually just been punched in the face you know that's how i kind of see to put it lightly you know that's kind of something that we have and i use the term that's defined up here by mary yellow horse braveheart um, her and another colleague 
you know, are the ones that kind of use the theory from uh, the um, Holocaust survivors around trauma and, and applied that to, you know, American Indians. And the, the definition is it's the total generational, emotional and psychological wounding that comes from group trauma experiences. And that's what the historical trauma is. It's the colonial colonization violence and its impact on us. Now, there's the trauma, the, what we've experienced, and then there's our trauma response. You know, how do we respond to that trauma? And, you know, this is when I talk about the impacts of colonization. If colonization took away our knowledge systems and our ceremonial systems, they also took away the ways in which that we heal from that trauma in healthy ways that are you know, from our cultural knowledge, from our own traditional teachings, from our own families, from our own communities, you know, all of that was disrupted in, in a lot of ways. And so now when we respond to trauma, it's not in the best ways. This is when we kind of talk about maybe it's the way we respond to all this trauma that we feel now. Maybe it's through high rates of poverty. Maybe it's through high rates of chronic diseases, you know, diabetes, cirrhosis, uh, hypertension, and maybe it's also, you know, high rates of su suicides within our community or maybe high rates of violence. Because historically, we should have been able to, you know, like what he's doing here, the character, he's crying. And that's a healthy way of crying, healthy way of responding to trauma. And that's what we talk about in our side, and, you know, our side of things. And when I say our side, the indigenous side of things, and this is what also informs, you know, what we do at the Labriola to talk about this next piece is, you know, talking about decolonization, which is in a lot of ways, a way for us to reverse the process of colonization. It's um, breaking that relationships, I said earlier, and looking at our, it's not looking at the colonizer and the colonizer anymore. It's looking at everyone as humans, as people, as people that deserve dignity, respect, and, you know, all of that that goes with, you know, treating other humans in a good way. In a lot of ways, it's for us to look at each other through kinship values, through community values, to say we're all part of the same conversation. We're all here as together, but how do we do this in a way that, you know, uh, uh, where we are, you know, respectful of one another? You know, like and I said earlier, I'm not here to kind of point fingers at everyone and say, you know, that, you know, the dominant community or dom dominant population at ASU, it's like all, I'm sorry, in the United States is, you know, at blame, what I'm trying to say here is that I'm trying to have people understand the process so that both sides of the community, the colonizer and colonizers, can understand the process so then we can move towards, you know, breaking that process and get to what I'm describing here, where we're talking to each other as human beings that have, you know, respect and dignity for one another, and not just as us as people, but also our knowledge systems are our teachings, our beliefs, and our, our our kinship values and things of that nature. And how we try to do that here is through, you know, cultural resiliency. I, we couch cultural resiliency work within um, decolonization. And cultural resiliency in a lot of ways is, you know, the social and uh, cultural networks and practices of the community. And, you know, we, you as indigenous people, it's like I said, colonization happened and it took a lot of things away from us, but we still have stuff. We still have ceremony. We still have language. We still have these things that we can rely on in terms of our, our, our community uh, to heal. And that's what we use, um, whether it's, you know, values like the culture, um, you know, kinship values, whether it's, you know, learning about our histories, learning about, you know, um, the possibilities of us seeing ourselves in the future, you know, things of that nature. That's what we talk about when we talk about culture resilience. It's about, you know, knowing our languages and cultures, knowing our history, knowing that we have a community here that has continued despite all the things that we've been through. And that's kind of what we're looking at. So we use a lot of culture resiliency in our work and that's kind of how we're defining it. In a lot of ways, uh, if you want to put it simply, it's basically our way for us to overcome the challenges of colonization and a way for us to heal um, from colonization using our language, culture, traditions, and ceremony, and things of that nature. And some of those can include, you know, some stuff for as indigenous peoples, learning our, your language, um, learning how to introduce yourself. Myself and Yitazbaj introduce ourselves in our languages, um, which is 
not all of us can, but some of us can, you know, and we try to rely on that and use that as much as we can. Knowing our histories, knowing how, how do we get to where we're at? You know, that's, there's that whole adage of like, you don't know where you're going if you never know where you, where you've been. And for us, it's looking at our history, understanding our history and where we've come from. Um, sometimes it's going to ceremony if you have that. And sometimes for us, it's even talking to our elders. And for us, we're trying to find places that we can do these within our library. So, and this is kind of where we kind of circle back to us as the, the Labriola and how we're defining indigenous librarianship. Um, it's about how do we at a center um, use what we have to, you know, do this stuff in a way that, you know, centers indigenous experiences, centers indigenous peoples, um, and centers, you know, culture resiliency, and how do we do that here? So I am going to go ahead and turn it over to you, Tazba, and she can talk a little bit about um, some of the ways in which we do that. Uh, so we have two Native librarians. Um, Alex Soto is Tohona Aftam, and he is the director of the Labriola Center. And then we have Vina Begay. She's Dene Navajo. She's an archivist and also the assistant librarian. So one of the ways in which you can break that relationship of um, the institution on showing that there are Native people within an institution is actually having Native librarians um, so that students at ASU or other universities can go to Native librarians because um, speaking from personal experience, the research I've had to do, have, I have had to do um, it can be pretty heavy um, learning about your history and colonization. And so being able to have an indigenous librarian um, as like a safe space, um, I think is very important. And um, yeah, really yeah. great that they're here. Yeah. And like I said earlier, you know, one of the things that I'm trying to make very clear is that we are at ASU and ASU is also an academic institution. It's a Western institution in a lot of ways may not have been built for indigenous peoples to be here. Um, so, but we're here. And, you know, when we come to these classes or any an institution, sometimes we don't get to see ourselves in those institutions. Um, and this is one of the ways in which we do that. It helps with what Vina or Tazba is talking about is being able to come to an uh, institution and seeing us in here helps us feel safer. Um, Feel helps us understand that we're not having to navigate um, the traumas, like I was mentioning earlier, that we kind of navigate daily. It, it lessens that. You know, there's there's a, a two librarians here that understand that they understand the lived experiences of indigenous peoples, so that informs you know how they approach um, talking to individuals. There's a flip side to that as well, is that you know, as indigenous librarians and other folks come into here, um, they have the opportunity to discuss, you know, topics around like cultural protocols during, um, for certain knowledge that's in the libraries, you know, how to access those things in ways that aren't harmful for individuals, you know, and also asking it do, should people, and when I say people like the, like non, the people from those communities um, from communities that they're not supposed to be, they're, they're not, they're not from, you know, they're not from these communities, should they have access to those, to that information? You know, lib uh, that's what our librarians can do, because they come from that background and that understanding. In addition to that, you know, we have our um, librarians, but the rest of our staff are also Indigenous. That includes not only the main faculty staff, but also, I'm sorry, the, the staff staff, but all of our student workers are also Indigenous. And this allows for, again, when a student or anyone that comes into our library, they see themselves here. They see this as indigenous peoples and it creates a different sense of community where we're, it's a community that they feel a part of as a part of, and rather than like going into a community that they're not feeling comfortable in. So, and that's one way we do our culture resiliency piece. It's it's making sure that our space is a safe space and also a nurturing space for healing and, you know, conversation and just, you know, sharing our experiences as indigenous people, you know, our frustrations, our joy and things of that nature. Uh, 
So in addition to, you know, just having people here as indigenous peoples, we, we also have a lot of different things that we do. So we try to link our native students and patrons that come to us to, you know, culture appropriate services that maybe that be through the library librarians, or it's through us in terms of our, you know, open stacks, our collections and things of that nature. And it's also for myself also, it's including things like talking to students about their research. Um, when I, it, we can talk about research in terms of just research, but we try to engage students to talk about research from what we call like indigenous research methodology practices, using their cultural frameworks and research, um, talking about how can their research help their communities heal. Um, so things of that nature. So we also do things like that. We also curate resources. So native people, again, like see themselves in libraries and we also have an archive, so we try to make sure that people can see that. And we try to work towards working with our tribal community members and par our partners to help them do, you know, cultural reclamation and strengthening their tribal sovereignty. Uh, we have a few projects that we work with tribal communities that we do that with. And I'll, we'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, so we have a very large collection here at the Labriola Center, and um, it extends from poetry, art, cookbooks, um, sci-fi, fiction, horror, um, and these books are mostly uh, are about Indigenous people, but also majority of them are written by Indigenous people. Um, so we think it's very important to see ourselves within these books and tell our own stories um, that is one of the ways in which we declare our sovereignty is that this is our story. We have a right to tell it. We have a right to share it. And so these books, um, students here and community members can uh, access these books and see that, um, especially like children's books too. Um, recently, we had a book display which showed a large expansive amount of children's books um, that have been recently released. And it was really empowering to see that. Um, I think myself as a young Navajo would have loved to see that, and but I'm really happy that other Indigenous girls and boys can access that. So in addition to what we're doing with our OpenStax collection is that, you know, historically, um, a lot of books are bound Indigenous peoples were usually books that were, you know, historical books, you know, books that were like talking about of us of the past, or maybe they were, you know, more... Um, nonfiction types of books, like research heavy books. Um, these days, we really try to expand our collection to include things like speculative fiction, um, telling stories where we're using our cultural knowledge to tell, you know, things like sci-fi, um, dystopian novels, you know, horror novels, things like that, because, you know, we should be able to do that. You know, as indigenous peoples, our languages and cultures, we're still here and we still have the ability to create new stories, you know, um, in addition to that, we also use our, our 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 history to talk about, you know, indigenous speculative fiction. I'm going to say this too is that you know, dystopian novels. Um, one way we talk about it in terms of uh, indigenous peoples is that we've already survived the apocalypse. You know, that's colonization. You know, so we we use that experience to even frame some of our books about the future and things like dystopian novels and things of that nature. So we use those things and we try to highlight those collections and those kinds of narrative works within our library. So that again, mo most important things that community members and students see themselves in these books, but they don't see themselves in not just the the old books and the not like research books, but they see themselves in like these new types of books that the horror books, the sci-fi books and things of that nature. So and in addition to, you know, uh, we're going to kind of break up a little bit here. So uh, one of the things that we also do is we do community outreach. Um, so like I said earlier, right, if the library is an institution, uh, not sure how to engage with as Indigenous peoples, not sure how to use a, li a library as a healing mechanism. One of the things that we do is we also do story time with the youth or we work with uh, local communities and we read children's books to them. These books are usually books written by Indigenous peoples. And our student staff are the ones that read those books to them. And this creates, you know, a conversation with the young folks to see that one, there's Indians in the library, but two, that there are young people in the library. It's not just the adults like myself and others, there's young people in here. And so we leverage that too, so that so the young folks can see that there's a, 
a pathway um, into you know these kinds of places for them and that there's a place for them here at ASU um, broadly, but more specifically that there's a place for them in the library. Um, then again, it, it's to see themselves in these spaces and to see themselves in that literature. In addition to, you know, that's the one side of the community part. The other part, again, I mentioned this earlier, is that we provide research support for students, staff, and faculty here at ASU, and, and in some cases, even um, community members, where we rely on books that were written by actual academics, indigenous academics, and working with them to, you know, develop research methodology that speaks to their um, communities, the, the students and research that impacts their communities and working with them to develop um, what we call, you know, our canon of knowledge or research. So for us as Indigenous peoples, we have uh, Indigenous research methodologies, you know, and we've had folks like Vine Deloria, Elizabeth Cook Lynn, that have been writing about these things. And so we use those books as ways in which to kind of look at research and academic research from a Native perspective. Again, back to culture resiliency, we use academia and academics as a mechanism to do that work in here. And that's something that we do here. Uh, myself, Alex, and Vina really push a lot of that within, um, you know, when people come to us for, you know, guidance and whatnot. So we also have our open stacks. So I mentioned that a little bit earlier. Uh, we have our open stacks collection. And one of the things that we do with our open stacks collection is that we we're in the process of reviewing our OpenStax collection and taking out books that may speak of indigenous peoples in disparaging ways. So, you know, uh, it's not a, a secret that a lot of non-natives come into our communities and, you know, take things from us, especially knowledge, but also the way we're written about in history books sometimes is not the best you know, depiction of us. So we're actually in the process, our librarians are in the process of taking out those books, reviewing the books that we have in our collection and taking out the ones that are not so, you know, don't speak of us positively. Um, and we're also taking out some of the books that may have cultural information in there, in the books that may not have been, that shouldn't have been in there in the first place. Um, and that's abiding by cultural protocols. As an example, for us as Navajo, there's some knowledge that can be shared most of the time, but there's some knowledge that can't be shared depending on the season. So things like that, we're, we're going through our collection to do that. All of our books, again, we try to privilege books that are authored by Indigenous peoples because that resonates with our community, uh, with our students and with the community members. And again, back to the idea of research for um, Indigenous peoples, we rely heavily on books that are written by academics, research academics that are Indigenous, because all of this speaks towards, again, this conversation of how do we use our resources, libraries, people, as a means to come to provide healing mechanisms or culture resiliency in our in our in our library. And so we do all that too, but we also do this stuff too. And I'll let you pause while I talk about this. Uh, so we put up book displays at both of our centers um, at Fletcher Library and Hayden Library. Um, so the approach that we're taking with book displays is to start a conversation to have people viewing these book displays ask questions, come to us, learn more about Indigenous peoples and our values. Um, and one of the book displays that I've done is um, about the open mic. We had a poetry book display. And the purpose for that one was to show how Indigenous people peoples have mastered um, form and movement within poetry. And also that kind of opens a conversation about us being able to master a language that was meant to assimilate and also take away our knowledge and culture. Um, and additionally, we talk about uh, land back. Um, done that, I've done a national parks book display um, and talked about the relationship between um, indigenous peoples and the national park system. Um, we've also recently put up an indigenous speculative fiction display um, right outside our center here at Hayden. And that one just shows like um, non or fiction books like sci-fi, horror, dystopia. Um, and because of that display and because of Eric, um, I've actually had the opportunity to read some of those. And it's just really empowering to see our stories um, within like non-traditional ways of like non-fiction history books. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and a lot of times when we do our book displays, we're asking the question of like, why are we doing this and how does our book display, one, create questions and conversation, but how does it contribute to like cultural resiliency? Like how is the National Parks book display talking about that? And we talk about it in the context of saying, you know, the history of that is national parks were built over indigenous land, you know, things like that. And it, it creates different kinds of conversations. So we we tend to lean into that in our spaces, really ask these harder questions when it comes to our book displays. And in addition to, you know, what we'd also do in our, theme, in our libraries, you know, we do a lot of library services, but it's also, how do we get this out to the community? How do we leverage the new technology and we do this through a couple of things we do this a lot through our social media and our instagram um site our profile so i'll go ahead and Taz will talk a little bit about that um, so we have the indigenous um badass which is posted on the first month um and the students pick out um an indigenous person who they think um, has really helped their community um, and that we should highlight and bring notice to and we also have um, book recommendations um, in like a video format. Um, we've been calling it Fresh Off the Press, and that just shows the new books that have been ordered and added to our collection. And then we also have um, a monthly book quote. Um, a student will write about a book that they recommend and that resonated with them. Um, we also have a blog post where students write about events and their experience or any projects that they're working on at the Labriola Center. And this is a kind of real quick look at what that looks like. And we use our social media again, it's 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 to show what we're doing, but it's also to kind of highlight the things that other indigenous peoples are doing because you know we're we try to make our space a community space. So our reach isn't just at ASU, it should also be our reach to the larger indigenous community. And this is one of the ways in which that we can, you know, highlight that. Um share with that community is through social media. So the Indigenous Badass is highlighting people from the community that don't necessarily aren't at ASU, but they're people doing great work in communities. And our new books can reach tribal communities. They, you know, We have a lot of folks that tell us that they really appreciate these new books and they read um, what, we're, what we're ordering so that they can go back and get those books. So it's a, it's a way for us to communicate and connect with our community uh, that's outside of ASU. In addition to everything else, we actually have a, have archive as well. And I'll let you talk, uh, talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, so our archive has ephemera, um, has microfiche, newspapers um, from the tribes within Arizona. It also has a national scope as well with rare books, um, very old and rare books. Um, when we, as we're like weeding through um, the distinctive collection, we're also noticing, noting books that are um, culturally sensitive and also disparaging. So we do have a distinctive collection and an archive and like it like talks about, it's very much focused on, you know, the indigenous peoples of the Southwest. <clears throat> we also have a lot of books that are, you know, based around language and culture. When Labriola was first established, there was, it was around the 1990s. Um, in the 1990s, and there was a lot of language revitalization projects coming about around that time. So Labriola was a part of that conversation. So a lot of those um, works or those uh, research and a lot of that um, uh, journals and things like that came out of that time, we have those here. And, you know, what that does is it helps us create an archive that's a little bit different, you know. It challenges uh, these narratives of extinction that you know what archives in a lot of ways tend to think about. So if you see the picture on the screen, it says the Pima Key, and then right next to it says a primitive home. Um, so the idea of primitive, I mean, it doesn't put us in a, a light. It makes us makes it sound like we are and have always been primitive, but that's not the case, you know. And that's what archives kind of tend to do. They put us in positions and put us in classifications that are, you know, hurtful and harmful to us. And as an example, if you have an indigenous student doing research and they see something like this, it continues that process of, like I said earlier, trauma. Um, it, it, it doesn't feel good when you read something from your community and it has like savage or primitive or, you know, in that. And then in addition to that, you know, the Library of Congress itself, you know, puts us in 
places that don't speak about it very highly, you know, we're usually in the E99s, you know, and we're usually like Indians of North America without, you know, describing who we are as people, you know, as Dene or as Aat um, or Apache or, you know, Wallapai and all that. It, 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 it kind of puts us in one, one category and it, what it does is it erases our identity, erases who we are as individuals and as people. So, you know, that, that's so one of the things that we're working through our archive is that we're challenging those kinds of things. We're looking at ways in which to redesign our classification systems and having more of a indigenous centered approach to those things so that we're not looking at uh, our collection and archive as a means of what has been always been the means of it is, you know, narratives of extinction. Because one of the things that we do with our archive is that what we try to do with it is we try to look at it in the context of indigenous memory. Uh, you know, if colonization happened, it took away knowledge and you know land and all of this, but it also took away memory. You know, where did we come from? And one of the ways in which we use our archive is to kind of reconnect to that. You know, reconnect to the struggles of the past so that we can inform the struggles of today, and find more important, like most importantly, in that empowerment to continue to do the work that we do to continue to to reclaim to continue to heal to continue to keep moving forward and to keep building spaces like our space so that our next generation the, the youth are coming into these spaces and finding a space where they see themselves so that they become i guess you could say more willing or able to heal and to to change things and to 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 do culture resiliency and in, in, in more impactful ways. So so that's kind of what we do. I think I'm literally at my last slide. So um, if you have any, any any information or if you have any questions or anything, here's our contact information, um, you're welcome to reach out to any of, um, any of us and we can work with you to kind of work through some of this. And again, I do want to, you know, reiterate our positionality here at ASU is that, you know, we're aware that we're an indigenous library within ASU's library system. Um, and, you know, we will do our best to work with everyone. But if you're in near tribal community or working with a tribal community, sometimes it's good to reach out to their tribal librarian and, you know, see what uh, ways you can help them or maybe work, talk with them and see if there's a way to do that too. So definitely do that. So with that said, I am going to stop my presentation and then see if we can go through some questions. Yes, we do have some questions. All right, my glass is back on. All right, the first question was, do you have a flyer for your story times that you could share? Um, not yet. So right now we're kind of in a transitional period. Uh, we've been working on so I don't get a chance to talk to you about a lot of this is that, you know, we're, at ASU, we're kind of in different phases. We're actually working towards having a grand opening of our new space. So this past six months and last semester, we've been trying to just focusing on getting on there, like the, the grand opening um, and get to that point and then start um, doing our story times with the, with the, you know, the youth or any the things that we're doing. Um, so eventually I want to get that back by the end of the semester, really kind of do that. But we've been really focusing on making sure that we can get this grand opening so we can provide more resources to, to the students here and even the, the larger Indigenous community at ASU. Um, but, you know, if there's other things that you're interested in, like, you know, open mic nights, things like that, we usually put that on our Instagram. So if there's if you want to know more about our, our events, when it's happening, where it's happening, definitely follow us on Instagram because that's where we post all of our information at. Right. Thank you. Um, the next question was, <clears throat> excuse me, will a list of problematic books eventually be shared for other libraries to consider evaluation of their own collection and decolonization efforts? And it was kind of like Cindy posted a link underneath, but just do you have a, a list? So we've been working with the Office of Indian Education. Um, every summer we've been, uh, actually fall, we've been working with them and one of the things that we've been working with them is uh, helping them and helping teachers, you know, find ways in which they can build their skills to kind of look at books to do a review of them. Um, so that's one thing that we've been doing with Office of the Education. As a result of that, one of the things that we're, we've done is um, a lib guide. 
So we do have a libguide that we're, um, I think, putting together mm -hmm. to eventually get to that point where we have a libguide of some of the books that may not be the most appropriate, uh, especially within a classroom. In terms of a broader, you know, list of books that are questionable, I don't know if we'll get to that point, but I know specifically and more in the short term, especially with the Office of Indian Education, we might have one that's more from that work um, that we kind of go through every year. I hope that helps. Um, and the LibGuides you can access at ASU um, at our website. There's a link there that you can access any of our LibGuides that we put together, which one might be helpful for you. Right. Um, let's see. The next question in the chat is um, the indigenous memory. Is there genealogy material as part of your collection? I don't, I don't know, but I haven't heard of one. Um, so I'm not really... I, I don't know if there's like genealogy, but we do have things like um, um, in our archive, there's, there's, you know, class, I'm uh, not sorry, what do you call those things? Uh, yearbooks and things of that nature. Yeah. Um, but we don't have anything that's genealogical where we have a list of like tribal um, enrolled members or anything like that. But there are things in our, in our collection where if you know someone, we might be able to track way, but maybe if you know where they went to school, things like that, we can probably look into our collection for those things. But I wouldn't say we have specific genealogical thing or you know information or data in our in our center, but it's more of an archival um, center that you know has newspapers, and, um, yearbooks, and journals, and all those those types of things. But you're welcome to reach out to us. I mean, we can try to see if there's something that we can connect you to. Okay, um, awesome. So, well, there's a question in here too, but um, it says, thank you so much for all you are doing. This is incredible. Do your collections slash resources focus primarily on indigenous peoples of North America, or does it include resources for indigenous peoples from Central and South America? And if not, do you plan to uh, expand your collection? <laughs> um so in our collection, I can't, I don't know specifically about our archival. I think there are some things that are like indigenous in terms of like, you know, South and uh, Central America, um, and also just in, in general, international kind of like indigenous when we talk about indigenous global, you know, because we do have books from, you know, from like New Zealand, from uh, the Aborigines and Australia, and we do have some books from, you know, uh, South and Central America. Um, so we do have some, I don't know if it's going to be a robust um, collection. Um, as, like I said earlier, we're building, we've been building these last two years to get to where we're at now with our, you know, our new space. Um, I think eventually one of the conversations that we will have as a center is to start including more, you know, global indigenous kind of works. Um, I will say also too, uh, if you're at ASU, you're welcome to come to our space. Uh, we have had other, um, a, a, a multitude of indigenous peoples come to our space and just be in our space. And as, as they get to know who we are and to know our collection, they've been able to find books that are from, you know, South and Central America and even Pacific Islander um, books and, you know, things of that nature. So it it's not a robust collection, but there are parts, um, pieces of, a, you know, larger indigenous peoples in terms of the, our collection. Um, next question, it says, over the past several years, it has openly come out that individuals who were once prominent pillars of being indigenous and librarians go to people for curating indigenous literature were never indigenous or pseudo natives. And then um, she gives the example of Debbie Reese uh, addressing this in her blog. And she wants to, this question is, um, how is Labriola navigating cultural appropriation and have you had to pull any of these books from the stacks of Labriola? Yes, uh, we were aware of like Debbie's work. So sometimes we'll go through her 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 uh, website and kind of look at some of the things that she's navigating. But honestly, um, the way we're doing our cultural appropriation is that we're literally going through our librarian Vina and Vina uh, and our student staff and our staff are, you know, literally going through books and reading and ca catching which parts of the books are, you know, culturally sensitive and are culturally degrading. And then, you know, going through a process of taking notes on that, where it's at. And then our librarian then goes through that process and looks at them again, and then pulls them off the shelf and puts them in what we call our um, high density collection. So we're, we're, 
taking them off our shelves, but we're not, you know, like destroying them. We're putting them off to the side and putting some protections on them. What that what I mean by that is, you know, if you want access to these books that are questionable, there's going to be certain questions that are going to be asked before you can get access to those books. Um, so. I guess to answer your question, we rely heavily on our librarian and to to kind of navigate those cultural, um, those you know, disparaging books. Um, so and we do try to look to others like Debbie and others to kind of help us with some of those. Um, yeah, so I don't. I hope that answers your question. And um, let's see, Sydney, have you found similarities with or worked on building resiliency with other marginalized communities who have also experienced colonization violence? Um, when doing that work, what do you need to reserve emotional, physical spaces for indigenous cultural experiences? So <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty big it's, a, it's a long question. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I think one of the things that, you know, as, as someone that's you know, I've done a lot of community work and activism. So there's, you know, a conversation there about BIPOC, um, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, you know, and we do work with um, BIPOC folks here at ASU. Um, but we're also very aware that you know, as Indigenous peoples, our experiences is different. You know, there's things like how does, uh, you know, sovereignty work within a conversation with BIPOC, you know, and you know, so we we work with folks, but we also do what like things that I'm doing right now with you all is there's a lot of literacy work, um, a lot of like where where how are how is the indigenous and BIPOC being defined and not being defined, and how are we defining our indigeneity that can work with a BIPOC framework? So it's a it's a constant back and forth. There's no easy answer to that. It's just figuring out where everyone's at, what 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 are the gaps that need to be addressed and some of the things that we need to be talked about. Um, but on like a surface level, you know, it, there's a conversation of just having support, you know, having each other's support in the things that we do. Um, so we do work with those folks and you know, you know by folks and it's the community driven archives here at ASU that we work more closely with. Um, we have been working with other folks that are, you know, of BIPOC and, you know, it's a conversation. It's just a conversation of getting to know each other and where we're at with each other. And, you know, there's some folks that are more willing to, you know, carry the emotional baggage and others, and that's fine. Um, I'm, I'm one of those people that's, yeah, that's, that's okay to have those hard conversations with those individuals and kind of find out where the middle ground is and how we can, and in a lot of ways, cannot work with each other, you know, because it's not like just because we're BIPOC that everyone gets is, you know, everything's all smooth everywhere. And it's not, and I'm aware of that. And we do our best to try to meet each other where we're at. And sometimes we're not able to, and that's fine too. So, you know, so we try to work through some of those. I hope that answers your question in small ways. It's, I guess it's to, to give it a really short answer is just be mindful of, you know, how we're defining indigenous and how are others in die defining indigenous and how can we find those middle grounds? Okay, um, just two more questions. Uh, let's <laughs> see. I'm just going back up to them. I'm just trying to read to make sure I got through all of them. Uh, I know you kind of answered about the uh, problematic texts, like what kind of resources you use, but then as far as using your library, and someone asked, is there written guidelines? Um, no. Uh, again, we're we're reestablishing ourselves at the library. We've only been doing this for... Um, about two years, we've been working on building out the Labriola again, and we just recently started working towards um, getting these kinds of protocols, like what are those guidelines? And it may take a long time, and I think that's part of this conversation, is I, I know there's a need for it, there's a big, a large need for these guidelines, but at the same time, there's the work that needs to be done, so it's done in a way that's you know thoughtful, nuanced, and things of that nature, and we're kind of, in a lot of ways, at that the, not I want to say at the beginning of the process, but the initial stages of that process, and you know we're we're doing the work, and once we get to a point where we can feel comfortable sharing what we've learned and things of that nature, we'll we'll put that out there. But uh, if you're ever wanting to have questions specifically around that, and talk to our librarian about where she's at that and where we're currently at, um, she might be open to kind of have that conversation with you. But again, it's we want to be able to 
be mindful that this takes time um, and, and we don't want to just be like, yeah, here's a guideline that we worked on in three months and this is that. We want to be able to make sure that we have our ducks in a row before we put some of this stuff out there. Because we, again, back to culture resiliency and harm, we don't want to be putting something out there if we didn't do it thoughtfully and you know in a careful uh, manner. So, yeah. All right. And then the final question is uh, the books that are being sequestered due to disparaging images, are they still in the catalog, still discoverable? As of right now, yes. So what we're doing is um, it's not really cens censorship because we're not like um, taking away the opportunity to like read from those books. It's just also flagging um, the book saying that this does contain harmful language, and that's really helpful for Indigenous peoples um, when they're reading that kind of material. Um, if it's culturally sensitive, then it will be limited on to what tribe you're from. Um, if you're also like, if you're allowed to see that within your tribe, because there's different roles um, in the community where you have like opportunities due to like leaders um, giving you those spaces. Um, but that's kind of how we're navigating it right now. Right. Well, that was it. It's exactly two o'clock. So <laughs> perfect, yay. Um, I just want to thank everyone for being here today and let everyone know you will receive an email with a link to the recording of this webinar. So have a wonderful day. Cool. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.